Thank you, Margaret, for an amazing introduction. Thank you all for having me here today. Um, today, I'm going to talk about optimizing hydration and debunking the protein myth. The reason is, is that water and protein, we often hear, is the key to how the body functions. And our goal is, is to, if we understand the underlying cause of why disease happens, we can actually turn disease into wellness. So my underlying goal is to transform health one person at a time. And the way we're going to start is just learning the find fundamentals. So what I want you to think about is what do you really need to survive? Is it water, food, air? Well, we know that a person can go weeks to even a month without food. But they cannot go days without water. Well, the reason is, is that we are mostly made up of water. The average person is 70% water. Your cells are 90% water. Your blood is 85% water. Your muscles are 75% water. You basically need water for every cell function to occur. So where is all this water distributed? Your brain and your heart each are 73% water. Your lungs are 83% water. Your skin, the largest organ in your body, is 64% water. Your liver, which helps clean out your blood, metabolize your hormones, manage your blood sugars, is 71%. Kidneys, which produces urine, helps clean out toxins, is 79%. Your bones, in contrast, are only 31%, which even though they're not mostly made up of water, you actually have to very effectively deliver water to your bones for all the nutrients to go to your bones. So what purpose does water serve? When you are really well hydrated, water is what lubricates every tissue in your body from your eyes, mouth, nose, to your joints and helps you move more comfortably and not feel that inflammation or arthritic pain. Water is what protects all your organs. From your gut, which needs lots of water to help you actually digest food and break that food down into nutrients and have the nutrients with oxygen be delivered to your cells. Water is what helps you not be constipated and have stomach problems to helping your kidneys and liver flush out toxins. It's what helps your brain feel that much sharper and it helps regulate your body temperature. So what I want you to think about is when you're not really well hydrated, how do you know? Because even though water is the most essential component of your cells, how do you know that you're dehydrated? Well, what I want you to imagine is if you've ever been in a bathtub for a while and you feel like your fingers are shriveling up, they kind of look like a prune, well, imagine that's the way it feels inside. So if your cells do not have enough water to do their job, you're gonna start like cringing. And if you stay in that position, like if you could almost go into that position right now, you're gonna feel like your back's gonna start hurting. Your joints are gonna start hurting. Your head's gonna feel heavy to like, you just kind of say, you know, I can't get up today, or I'm dragging today. Or you're gonna start feeling like your belly hurts, right? Because you can't actually properly digest food. So you might end up having bloating, heartburn, constipation, smelly gas, to your heart is working a lot harder. So your heart will say, you know, I've gotta beat really fast to actually be able to do my job. And eventually the rhythm can get irregular. Your lungs are gonna breathe more shallow and you might eventually actually just start feeling like you're short of breath and not knowing why. And you just don't feel like you're as sharp. The other way you're gonna know is there's some physical signs. So for example, look at your tongue. When you wake up in the morning and you brush your teeth, when you have this white, thick film on it, that's dehydration. The reason is, is that the mouth is the beginning of your digestive tract. If there's not enough water that's going into the cells, then basically food's not gonna break down properly. And when food doesn't break down properly, there's an alarm that goes off where your gut says, hey, I'm not gonna take this food that's partly digested, so some of it's gonna come back up and it'll actually create a white film on the tongue. 
Number two, you could have sores on the sides of your tongue, right? And that's dehydration. When you plunk your, when you pull your skin up, we call it skin turgor, and you see the skin now go back down, it slightly stays up, now that's real dehydration. When you see this gentleman keeled over because his stomach doesn't feel right, well, there's probably just not been enough water in his gut for the digestion to occur. And another easy way to figure out how hydrated you are is just look at the color of your urine. When you're really well hydrated, your urine is gonna look the same color as water. It's gonna be clear. When the urine starts becoming a little bit more colored, yellow, you're starting to get dehydrated. When it starts getting darker, now you're gonna start feeling it. But you may not put the connection together that you're not getting enough water in your cells, and so your urine is gonna get darker and darker and darker, but you're getting sicker and sicker here. So, our next question is, well, how much water do I need? The simplest rule of thumb is you take your weight divided by two, and then divide that by eight, which is eight ounces. And this is equal to the minimum number of cups of water you need per day. Now, if you take a lot of medication, you're not feeling really well, you have a fever, you're working out, or you're just, it's a really hot day, you actually need more than just your, you know, eight, nine cups of water. Now, here's the thing, though. If you ask some of us, I mean, just ask myself, I struggle with hydration. And you, you'll tell me, you need to drink 10 cups of water. There's no way I'm gonna do that. Because if I drink water all day, I'm gonna be running to the bathroom all day. I can't run to the bathroom while I'm seeing patients, because that would be kind of rude, or I can't run to the bathroom right now while I'm giving this presentation. So, here, I have a problem, because I can't keep up, and you don't just catch up. So you don't just say, well, I'm gonna drink a ton of water today, and then I won't have enough the next day. Our body isn't allowed to do that. You know, it's not allowed to say, well, you know, you can work really hard today, but you can go to sleep tomorrow. Right? It, needs, it needs it consistently. So here's the trick, is you gotta find an effective way for water to be delivered to your cells. So it's not about, you know, you'll hear, I hear many people say, well, you know, I drink a ton of water, and I'm just peeing all the time, and I still feel thirsty. So I want you to step back and ask yourself, maybe they're actually not getting the water into the cells. How do we turn it around and find that delivery mechanism that's gonna work? So here's a quick, you know, spreadsheet about how much water does a child to an adult need. You know, on average, a child needs between three to eight cups of water, depending on their age. If you're a teenager to an adult, if you're a male, 14 and older, you need at least 13 cups. And if you're a female, you need at least nine cups. The discrepancy between a female and a male is because a female tends to have more fat tissue, and fat tissue doesn't have as much water as lean tissue. Now, the key here, this is also true for anybody who carries extra weight from a child to an adult. If you're carrying extra weight, so you've got more fat tissue, you actually don't have as much of a water need. But the key is those individuals actually need water to be really effectively delivered to their cells for their cells to work properly. So here's the key. It's all about figuring out the most effective way for water to go into your cells. So it's not about just drinking a ton, you've gotta to time things right, because we all work under a certain rhythm. So trying to push it too fast or you know, do it, whatever works for you, doesn't always work out. So here's the simplest rule of thought. Ooh, sorry. Number one, when you first wake up in the morning, I want you to make sure you drink at least two cups to three cups of warm water. Don't just gulp it down really fast, Take your time, but drink those three cups at the same time. This is going to wake your body up so it gets started, right? Now, it doesn't mean you wake up in the morning and you rush to making your cup of coffee or your tea, because that actually tells your body you're gonna be dehydrated. Number two, it's gonna tell your body it's gonna be harder to digest food for the rest of the day. So just drink those two or three cups of water warm 
when you first wake up, and then wait at least 30 to 40 minutes before you eat or drink anything else. You gotta tell your body, get ready, I'm gonna start my day. Number two is you wanna make sure that you drink water before and after your meals, but not during your meals. The reason is, is when you're drinking a lot of liquids during your meals, you're actually diluting out the digestive enzymes. So you won't be able to properly digest food. And what happens, if you don't properly digest food, then those nutrients are not gonna go into your cells. So what's gonna happen? You're gonna feel like you ate this big meal, and then a few hours later, you're hungry again. But that doesn't make sense because we're not designed to eat 20 times a day, right? We're supposed to eat, it's supposed to do its thing, the nutrients are going in the cells, and we have energy. Instead, I often hear people say, you know, I ate and then I feel sleepy. That doesn't make sense because food is for energy. So the key is, is that do not consume liquids while you're eating. Wait at least a half an hour before and at least a half an hour to 40 minutes after a meal. Now the key is, is that your, the water has to naturally be in the food. Then it works. Number three is you want to make sure you drink at least a cup of water before and after you shower. It will help lower your blood pressure. Now, the way I want you to think about this is if you've ever gone to a sauna or a hot tub, you'll see signs which will say, make sure you only stay in here for 15 minutes, make sure you drink enough water. Well, it's no different than when we actually take a shower. Most of us take a hot shower. So if we take a hot shower, what happens is, is that we're actually, it's really dehydrating. So just fuel yourself up before you go in and right when you come up, have a cup of water. And water is always warm, it's not cold. The last part is drink a cup of water before you go to bed. Now that, the reason is, is because it's, it's that there are so many important normal physiologic functions that are happening when you're sleeping. So you've got to have those cells lubricated so they can do their job when you're sleeping. So if you give your body a little bit of water before you go to bed, you actually help things stay in a better rhythm. Now, go back to what I was saying about trying for myself to drink eight, nine cups of water a day. I can't do it. So the key is, is that you wanna make sure the water is naturally in your foods. So it serves many purposes. You're getting the water, your body can digest the food, and you don't feel that parchedness when you're eating. So the thing you wanna think about is that most foods actually have a ton of water. For example, if you take any green vegetable from acorn squash, cauliflower, peppers, tomatoes, fruits, they're like mostly water. And the way you're gonna know that is just, if you ever have cooked that item just a tiny bit, you'll see it kinda get mushy, then it naturally has a lot of water in it. Now, the next thing about water and foods in water is it's all about the acidity of the food. Because your body works with a pH of 7.4, and it has to stay around there for all of your cell functions to happen. If it's too acidic or it's too alkaline, then there's havoc. Now, the key is, is that your diet should be 80% alkaline and 20% acidic to actually reach that 7.4 pH. So, the simplest way to look at it is which foods are acidic and which foods are alkaline. It's, it happens that the foods that we talked about that are rich in water are also the most alkaline. So, for example, all of your leafy greens, your peppers, cucumbers, avocados, they're all alkaline. And then let's go on the opposite end. When you think about the highest level of acidity, you're thinking about alcohol, sugar, artificial sweeteners, even a bunch of natural sugars, they're all very acidic. Next is dairy, red meat, popcorn, burgers, um, ice cream, coffee, very acidic. Then you've got like white rice, chicken, bread, wheat, soy milk. Now a slightly acidic is milk, chocolate, coconut, fish, eggs, nuts. 
So again, like I said earlier, it's not that you need to have like a total alkaline diet, but you've got to have a better balance more on this side. Because if you realize that when you look at your daily diet and it tends to, you know, let's say you have a glass of wine every evening and it's on the high level of acidity. You know, it's kind of hard to keep catching up over here because if you eat a lot of this stuff and you don't have enough of this stuff, then you're running on the acidic spectrum. So what happens? Your body feels like it's in a deficit. It doesn't have what it needs. So inflammation is gonna set in because the cells don't have what they need to thrive, right? So, and the other thing is you need the water and you need oil because that is what lubricates your cells for every cell function to happen. So, this goes into bioavailability of protein. It has to do with, you've got to be able to absorb the food. It's not just what you see at the naked eye, it's the way it works inside. So, you've gotta be able to absorb the nutrients. And the key is, is that it's gotta be alkaline because it has to work in a medium that your body you know, is familiar with. And you've got to get enough protein. So if you think about spinach, kale, broccoli, they are 49 to 45% protein. Cauliflower is 40%. Cucumbers, which I always thought are just full of water, they're 24% protein. Now, in contrast, we often hear you have to have some sort of an animal protein to get enough protein for your cells to function. Here's the key though, their bioavailability on protein for red meat is only 25.8%. Eggs is 12% and chicken is 23%, which is half to 75% less than kale. The other key part is all of these foods down here are all on the acidity spectrum. So the key is, is that if you have a predominance of this, you're not gonna be able to have an alkaline reaction inside your body. You're not gonna actually be able to absorb the nutrients, right, so that you're using the protein for the building blocks for your cells. So let's just then talk about protein, right? There's a lot of, you hear a ton in the media from your physicians about the essential need for a protein-rich diet. So let's just understand what is it. Protein is nitrogen-containing substances formed by a variety of 20 amino acids. 12 amino acids in adults and 11 amino acids in children are non-essential. Non-essential means that you can synthesize them in your body. Eight amino acids are essential, which means you have to obtain these amino acids from your diet because you cannot synthesize them from in your body. So all dietary animal protein contains all eight essential amino acids. They are a complete protein. An individual plant protein will lack one or two essential amino acids. So that one item itself will be an incomplete protein. The key is, is that they're all different. So a kale, a mushroom, lentils, they all have a different amino acid formula. So if you mix a bunch of different things together, you actually get a complete protein. Protein's purpose is that it is a major structural component of your muscles and tissue. It is important to produce hormones, enzymes, and hemoglobin. Protein is critical for your human growth and metabolism. Protein is a form of energy, but it is not the primary source of energy. We currently believe that if you have more protein or amino acids available to your muscles, you will allow protein synthesis to be enhanced and you will not lose lean tissue. So there was a great study that was done. It looked at comparing four ounces of red meat with four ounces of black bean. They both have 24 grams of protein. The beef has 320 calories. The black beans has 120 calories. Now, the beef is on the highest level of acidity, whereas the black beans are totally alkaline. The beef is high in cholesterol and saturated fats, which the black beans don't have any cholesterol and saturated fats. The reason is, is that cholesterol and saturated fats basically comes from animal protein. And, and also nuts are naturally have you know, a lot of cholesterol and saturated fats, but nuts 
are, you know, are more on the um, alkaline side. The other thing is that we're also finding that with foods with higher cholesterol and saturated fats, which directly associated with cardiovascular disease. The beef has no fiber, whereas the black beans have nine grams of fiber. And we know that fiber is really critical for your digestive system to work. The beef is high in hydrocylic amines, which are associated with cancer cells. The black beans are rich in phytonutrients, which are really critical for your immune system, for your antibody, uh, sorry, like antioxidants, for producing, you know, a, a right hormone balance. Another study that was done looked at a bowl of lentils versus a piece of steak. And what they did was outside of, you know, what we've already figured out that yes, there's probably more protein that's bioavailable in the lentils than in the steak. They actually looked at all the different components like your calcium, iron, vitamin A, vitamin C. They found that the lentils has 74 milligrams of calcium, the steak has only 17 milligrams. I think what I found to be the most interesting was the iron. Because as a physician, I've always been taught that if you're iron deficient, you've got to have meat. The key is, is that the lentils had 13 milligrams of iron, and the steak only had 2.7 milligrams of iron. It didn't have any fiber on the side. You had a ton of fiber, vitamin C, and vitamin A. So that leads us to understanding Outside of just protein, you know, we always get asked, well, where are you going to get enough iron? Where are you going to get enough calcium? So here, all these foods that you see on this screen, they are so rich in iron, from your soybeans, your different types of beans, to your watermelon, your apricots, your chia seeds. They're all full of iron. Now, the question that we often get asked, though, is that there's two types of iron, and you're supposed to have iron that's heme iron, heme is blood, which only comes from an animal source, or there's non-heme iron, which only comes from a plant source. So we often hear that you have to have heme iron for your blood. Well, what we found is, is that it's all actually about absorption. It's not about what you see in front of you, it's about the way it works inside your body. So, for optimizing iron absorption, if you take any one of these foods and you combine that with vitamin C, which is broccoli, bell peppers, a citrus fruit, you actually absorb the iron. The other key part about absorbing iron and even other nutrients is how big is your meal at any setting. If you fill up your stomach to the point that you are really full, there's no room for your stomach to do its job, to contract those muscles to help you digest food. So you have to actually fill it up to the point where you're like, you know, I'm not totally full, but I could just pause for a moment because it's going to take a little time for your stomach to say, okay, now I can digest the food. So it's really key to actually have smaller meals more often instead of filling it up with a huge amount because you will not absorb iron or other nutrients. The third tip is caffeine. When you have caffeine, Within an hour or two of a meal, you actually make it harder to digest the nutrients because the caffeine is a vasoconstrictor. That means that it makes it harder to actually break the food down and absorb the nutrients. So if you're gonna have your coffee or black tea or soda, you wanna have it at least two hours before or after your meal. So then you can absorb your iron and other nutrients. So the key here is that it's not just about how much iron does a food have and you have to absorb it. So one little tip is spinach. There's a ton of iron in spinach, but iron also contains oxalates, and oxalates prevent iron absorption. Oxalates are hard on the kidneys. So I often recommend try not to eat raw spinach. Have it slightly cooked. You will absorb the nutrients more effectively. OK, the last question I always have been asked is about calcium, right? When you've got, you're dealing with brittle bones, osteopenia, osteoporosis, we often as physicians have encouraged our patients, make sure you drink a ton of milk. The problem is, is that yes, milk has a ton of calcium. Now, remember on one of the prior sides, dairy products like cheese, ice cream, they're very acidic. Even milk is acidic. So what happens is when you have it inside your gut, your body says, whoa, I know there's a lot of calcium here, but this is acidic. 
So when you have other foods that are also very acidic, what your body does is that it can't, it's freaking out because it can't do its job. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, I need to create an alkaline reaction. So it will pull calcium off your bones and other tissue to create that right pH. Now you've got all this extra calcium sitting in your blood and you've gotta clear it out. So your kidneys are looking at the situation saying, okay, I've got all this calcium from the milk products and I've got all this calcium that got pulled off my bones and other tissue. I gotta clear this out. The thing is, is that the kidneys are not just dealing with the calcium, they're also dealing with the nitrogen and the sulfur that are in all of the animal proteins. So the kidneys eventually are overloaded trying to clear all this out and they'll get tired. So actually it's one of the number one cause of chronic kidney disease, which we have a huge epidemic of, it's just, it's our diet, right? If we have a much more acidic diet, then our body's trying to correct the situation and the kidneys eventually just get tired. So when the kidneys are getting tired, now you've got all this extra calcium. Where's it gonna go? Because it can't, you can't pee it all out. So you're gonna deposit the calcium in different places. You're gonna deposit it on the kidneys and you're gonna get kidney stones. You're gonna deposit it in your gallbladder and you're gonna get gallbladder stones. You're gonna deposit it on your blood vessels and we call it calcification. So if you see a cardiologist and they say, well, yeah, you've got all these calcifications when we look at your scan. Well, where did it come from? Because this is, the calcium is depositing on all of your blood vessels, right? So when you do an image of the, like an MRI and you see calcifications, which we then associate with dementia, all this calcification is depositing. So it eventually gets really hard and the vessels get really hard and fragile. And so that's the disease that's been setting in over a long period of time. And it doesn't have a chance to really recover because we primarily then will have an acidic diet. So the, the pathology just continues. So the key here though is you can turn it upside down because if you actually shifting to more an alkaline, foods that have more water naturally in them, your body like starts like jumping up and down super happy because it's like, hey, I got what I need and I don't have to work so hard. So the thing you wanna think about is calcium. It's all these foods here that are colored green to onions, butternut squash, they are all full of a high level of absorbable calcium. But they're also rich in magnesium, iron, vitamin A, vitamin C. All these different components are really critical to your cells function, to keeping your bones really strong, to keeping your immune system really strong, to preventing cancers, cardiovascular disease, keeping you really sharp so that you can remember everything that you're learning today, to, you know, you're basically preventing a lot of disease. So the take home today is I want you to kind of think outside the box where what you see in front of you is not always the way it actually works inside. That it's about, you know, it's, it's about the, the way, if you try this, you're gonna know it, you're gonna feel it, you're gonna feel lighter, you're gonna feel sharper, and then you know for sure, does this work for me? The other thing is about timing that it's not just overdoing it at any given time. We all work under a certain rhythm. So timing is real, really critical. And when you time it right, you automatically see that your body responds really quickly. So if you're 50, you're 80, you're 90, you can turn it around. I'm Dr. Payal Mandari. I'm the owner and senior physician of a new integrative medical clinic, Advanced Health. We have just launched a new center four months ago, and we are op we're having our first open house tomorrow. Um, so come from five to seven. We're right up the street across from CPMC. You're gonna meet not only just myself, um, there's a bunch of other integrative physicians, nutritionists, acupuncturists, massage therapists. So our philosophy is to really take amazing care of patients so that we are transforming disease into wellness, but we're doing it one person at a time. I think, I actually think we have like five minutes if anyone has a question. I wonder if you could address a amount of carbohydrates and the legumes you were talking about? 
and, and carbohydrates. Well, the thing about carbohydrates, it's there's complex carbohydrates and there's simple carbohydrates. So when a food breaks down really quickly into sugar, it actually, again, creates a more acidic reaction. So if you just, again, look at foods and say, well, these are all carbohydrates, it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. Like a legume is a complex carbohydrate, so it breaks down at a very different rate than a piece of bread. Um, number two is it's also about like the way it's prepared. So again, if something is prepared in a way where you get instant energy, then yeah, you're gonna get a, uh, you're gonna get a higher level of blood sugar. If it has to take its time to be digested, then it actually is more aligned with then your body being able to absorb those nutrients and giving you energy. So, and the key about beans or legumes is that they can have both an acidic and an alkaline reaction. So the way you have a more alkaline reaction is you wanna actually soak them because when you soak them, they actually make them more easier to digest. So they create a more alkaline reaction. Otherwise, if you don't soak certain beans, it actually makes you feel really bloated and backed up. Question over here. Couple of questions. Um, when it comes to supplements that you need to take, we need to take with our meals, because we're not to drink water with our meals because of the enzymes you mentioned, when is the best time to take the supplements? Uh, like half an hour after the meal or something like that, and it's still effective? So that's my first question. And the second question is, what are good sources of fish these days without you know, all the mercury and lead and stuff like that? Thank you. So first question is about when to take your supplements. Yes, I did mention not to try to drink much, but again, drinking a tiny bit is okay because otherwise you're gonna choke on trying to swallow this pill. Um, it really depends on the supplement, right? Is it in a pill, powder, liquid form? So there's a lot of creative ways that some supplements are actually more effective if they are in a powder or liquid form. If they're a pill supplement, then I often will say, you know, at least get some food in you before you actually take a big pill because, you know, your body, otherwise the pill is gonna feel like a meal. So having a little bit of water with, with your, taking your supplement with your meal, it's gonna be okay. Um, and again, the other thing is also key about, you know, timing. So most of my, like if I recommend any kind of vitamins, I, if they're for daytime use and for energy, I usually recommend them during the day because again, that's when you need your energy. So if you're taking a ton of things at night, it might be counterintuitive to the way your body's designed to work. Um, the second question is about fish. So there was a really great study that came out in 2016, where unfortunately, they've looked at all the different types of fish. And it is really hard to recommend which fish is really safe, because the mercury levels, the arsenic levels, are extremely high in our water, in our soils. So it's really hard to tell you that this fish is completely immune from having any mercury levels, and this fish is. It's kind of like if I said, well, you know, this group of people here is never gonna get high blood pressure, and this group of people is. So, I honestly can't tell you in today's world, is there a fish that's totally safe? Because the mercury is really high in all the waters. And what we're finding is, in a, in a bunch of studies that were done, they found that if you eat two tiny servings of fish twice a week, you will have mercury poisoning in two weeks. And it actually takes about eight and a half years minimum to clear the mercury. And again, if you have a much more acidic diet, there's no way you're gonna clear all that toxins out. So there's too many other important things your, your body is dealing with. The other really great long-term study that was done in Europe showed that when women, while they were pregnant, were having tiny, tiny servings of fish through their pregnancy, they actually found that when they looked at the children at ages two, four, and six, every child was overweight to obese. So their measurement was mercury and weight. And so it's not just about this kid ate too much, it literally is about how your genes are expressed, how your body functions. So there's a lot of more long-term studies that are coming out showing that, again, it's, it's going back to what I was saying, what you see in front of you is not exactly the way it works inside. There's a lot of layers here of complexity. And so we're just trying to keep the big picture so it's easier for you to make your choices.
best thing to do about fish is to use this, to eat the smallest fish you can have, like an anchovy, because it hasn't built up the load as a larger fish would have built up. That may be true, but remember, a tiny level of mercury is so toxic to a human being. So it's not about the quantity, it's just, it's just hard on us, right? So again, it's not to say we're all exposed to different types of toxins, right? It's not possible to live in the world today. The key is, though, is that you're creating an environment where your body can still fight those fights and still take good care of you. I just wanted to let you know that there is more time. Uh, you have another 10 minutes oh, okay. for questions. But, and I have a question for you. Can you say something about um, any resources, uh, cookbooks or information, or if there's a site on, um, on the internet where people could get this kind of information in detail? That's number one. Any resources? Number two, talk, maybe talk a little bit about you know, like beans and rice or vegetarian, how, you know, resources where people could learn more about how they could combine vegetables and so forth um, in order to make those whole proteins. Uh, okay. Um, in terms of resources, that's a great question. Again, as I said earlier, I really do provide a lot of personalized care, and there's a lot of information out there in the media, and it's hard to figure out you know, what do you listen to, what do you not, because you can get convinced of anything. I think the key is you do need somebody to kind of guide you, you know, some sort of resource. Um, being biased, I would definitely say check out our website because we actually write a blog every week and there's a lot of great data out there about, um, from topics from any kind of disease to nutrition, um, but it is key that you have somebody to help guide you through this because it gets really confusing after a while. Um, in terms of vegetarian or vegan or paleo, again, there's a lot of hype about a lot of different types of diet. Again, I want you to step away from you know, a lot of that labeling to kind of, what I was trying to get across is, you know, how do you understand what's going on inside, right? It's about the food's gotta have a lot of water in it. Um, it has to not just break down sugar immediately. Um, and timing when you're eating it. So if you think about like rice or different types of grain, grains are not all bad. The key is, is that the biggest staple of grains in the United States all are refined, right? So if you think about what do we primarily have in the United States? We have rice, we have wheat, soy, and corn. So what happens? Corn breaks down to sugar really fast. Um, rice is often white rice, and it's often tainted with arsenic. Wheat is really heavy. I mean, it takes a lot of energy to break down wheat, and it is in like everything you can find, from breads to like every processed foods, condiments. And so it breaks down to sugar really quickly, but it creates an inflammatory reaction. But there are a lot of other grains, like millet, amaranth, quinoa. So the key is, is not just like um, about avoiding wheat completely, it's a balance, right? So I'm not saying everybody should go gluten-free um, because there's a lot of problems with that because people are still now then having still a lot of processed food that all break down to sugar. So the key is, is that time it right, where if you start eating when you're like, I'm starving, you're, you're too late, right? So there was a whole point about drink water first then wait a half an hour, then eat, and eat just enough so you're not starving right? So time it right. Then your body actually has a completely different reaction where you can mix in different types of grains and definitely mix in some green vegetables and definitely have some beans, right? And my favorite beans are chickpeas, black beans, mung, the different types of lentils. Um, they're just easier to digest. If you're using a bigger bean like kidney beans, um, black beans, chickpeas, pinto beans, you really need to soak them overnight or your stomach is going to hurt. So, um, and with lentils and mung beans, you don't really have to soak them. But again, mix it up. It's not just one thing. Um, it's kind of like that bowl of lentils. They probably had celery and onions and tomatoes along with the lentils. So it's like a hodgepodge, which your body likes because the foods all break down at a different rate. So you means you absorb the nutrients at a different rate. Question. Um, I understand there's a theory out there that if we fast for three days under a doctor's care that has an ability to restart the immune system again? 
Yes, so there is a lot of research that's been around both now and it's been known for thousands of years that fasting is one of the most effective ways to boost your immune system. Because when you fast, you're not constantly saying, here, there's more food, you gotta keep working. If you kind of fast, your cells that are in hibernation actually wake up. So my rule of thumb is that try to fast every night, which means that dinner is your lightest meal and you fast at least 12 hours between breakfast and uh, sorry, between dinner and breakfast, and that you fast at least three hours before bed. So you're priming your body to do its thing when you're resting. In terms of fasting for three days, that is, depends on the person, right? So hydration is still key. That, you know, you can't live days without getting enough water. So fast, but you gotta drink water then. So it is very case dependent if I have somebody go on a five day fast, a liquid fast, or a three day or a one day. But I definitely think if you've kind of like overdid it one day and you've, you know, overindulged, the easiest way you're gonna turn it around is just try and do a lot more liquids the next day or so. Let your body kind of get hydrated, do its thing, and then it'll be ready to go. Hello? When you were discussing water and the fact that we need to drink much more fluid, what about coffee drinkers, tea drinkers? Is that the most effective way to get the amount of water? I mean, I drink coffee and tea a lot. Well, I mean, think about it. It's very dehydrating. So what happens? You keep doing it. Right? And then when you do it, you might add sugar or soy milk or coconut milk or milk. So what's happening? You're constantly getting an acidic reaction. So you're then, it literally changes what you're gonna choose to eat, how your energy is, and you're thinking, oh, I drank this, so I feel energized. Well, why is it then a little bit later you're back looking for that next quick sugar, right? Because you don't feel like you're thriving. You're kind of like, oh, I don't have what I need. And remember, the caffeine doesn't let you digest food. So the key is, is that I'm not saying don't have coffee or don't have caffeine, but if you give that to yourself like first or throughout the day, then you might ask yourself, am I really cheating myself? Because things aren't working inside, right? Because like I said in one of the slides, you can't absorb nutrients when you have it right around when you're eating. So if the key is give yourself what you want first, see how it feels, and then have you know what you want to have but just give yourself a chance to really be in tune with what you're feeling versus like when you're feeling not so good when you're feeling that tired and that dehydration you're going to do whatever it takes to feel like you're waking up but you keep doing the same thing again and again so i just want you to step outside of it and imagine what would it be like if you were looking upon yourself and say does this make sense so it's not saying don't do it it's just saying time it right Give your body what it really wants and see what it feels like. So thank you for a very uh, interesting talk. Can you tell us a little bit about the spices, turmeric, curcumin, and that kind of thing? Is that healthy for us? Spices are super important for our foods, right? They make them taste really good, and there's a medicinal component to many spices. Um, a lot of medications were originally derived from plant sources, right? And spices are a plant source. And many of the med medicines that many of you may take now, they were originally designed from a plant source. So spices make foods fun. For example, turmeric is an extremely potent anti-inflammatory. It thins the blood out. Um, I use it during the day. I never use turmeric at night. The medicinal extract of turmeric is curcumin, so there's a lot of attention that curcumin is getting now for joint pains, to cardiovascular disease, to mental health. So turmeric is pretty inexpensive as a spice. Um, you don't ha need a lot to actually go a long way. Um, the root turmeric works differently than the spice because the spice is really concentrated. So I'll use turmeric in, I'll put it in my water to put it in cooking. Um, black pepper is also great. It actually heats up the food, but it makes it easier to digest. Again, it's not for nighttime use, it's daytime use. Coriander, cumin, mustard seeds. Um, if you're not like really familiar with a lot of spices, you can always just get curry powder and it it really is a blend of a, a bunch of stuff. I would definitely suggest stay away from all these ready-made spice um, mixes that you get at the grocery store. There's a ton of salt in them. Um, 
But spices are, they, they change the food and they make it taste really good. Now, in terms of salt, salt is, you know, it's, you hear a lot about salt in all of our processed foods. Um, salt makes you really dehydrated. So I, salt is very important for hydration, but if your food naturally just has a ton, a ton of salt in it, and that's the way you're spicing it up, what's gonna happen is you're actually not gonna actually, all that food is not gonna go in the cells because the salt level is so high. So based on osmosis, you're actually gonna feel more fluid retention um, and, and you're gonna be more dehydrated. So salt's important, you don't need a lot of it. It's pretty, it's pretty much in everything we eat. Um, so change it up. Add some more fun spices. They don't, spice does not have to be spicy. It just makes the food taste better. It actually makes the gut work better. Okay. Here. Hi. Um, I have two questions. One of them is you were discussing uh, seafood, fish, and, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, is there any fundamental difference as far as mercury or, or, or toxins that build up in fish? Uh, I, I really, really like salmon. I eat it a lot. And um, I'm wondering if there is any kind of major difference between wild and uh, farm-raised. I, I seem to like the taste of farm-raised a little bit better. My second question is, and you've probably discussed this already, um, the effect of sugar or other foods on depression? So in terms of fish, which is if it's wild versus farmed. So the thing about farm, you're not just dealing with mercury, you're dealing with all the other things they inject into the fish. So with farm fish, they'll actually inject it to make it look like it looks like a wild salmon. But again, that, that, those fish are really exposed to a lot of yucky stuff. Um, and unfortunately, there is really no way to say you're not going to be exposed to mercury um, at, with consumption of fish. The other thing, though, is you're, you know, we only remember what we eat that day half the time, but in our body, it's not like your body's sitting there saying, well, you know, I had like the salmon on Monday and I'm totally fine on Friday. No, it's all still dealing with processing this because the fish is still somewhat acidic. There's higher levels of mercury. The other key thing is, yes, fish has a ton of protein in it. The problem is, is that inside your gut, it actually can create somewhat of an acidic reaction. And two, it's actually really hard on your kidneys to process a lot of that protein. So that effect is happening for days. And the older you are, and the more pathology that's going on, it doesn't just resolve in two days. It could like, you could have a slice of fish on Monday, and the effect is still happening on like Friday and Saturday, right? But you might have forgotten how it makes you feel. So, it's not to say don't have it, it's just a saying that I think that there's a lot of marketing behind this is farm, wild, versus, you know, this has got, this doesn't have any mercury. I think there's just, there's a lot of marketing behind it to help you then believe that it's totally clean, right? Um, your second, can you repeat your second question? I'm sorry. Oh, sugar. And depression, yes, there's a clear correlation that sugar, it really affects our mood. I mean, think about like a kid or an adult and you have a little piece of pastry. You ever like look at the kid and they're like spastic? Well, imagine that you're just like, what's wrong? Well, think about if you're having a lot of foods that just break down to sugar. It gets exhausting. You know, if you're kind of feeling on a high, then a low, a high, then a low you'd start feeling anxious. And if you feel like that all the time and then you can't even put together the fact that what you're eating is making you feel this way and it changes your reactions, eventually you're gonna get depressed, right? The other key thing is that sugar, you know, basically is the highest level of acidity. What it's doing is it's not feeding any of your good bugs in your body. So if you don't feed your really good bugs, then you're not gonna produce those calming chemicals because the highest percentage of serotonin, norepinephrine, um, epinephrine that we need to help balance our moods, to he keep us sharp, they're primarily produced from our gut. So if you keep giving foods, that sugar is just an emergency, like give you quick energy. But if, if what you have is basically emergency, emergency that you're communicating to your body, how are you gonna feel happy?
right? Because you're gonna feel like an alarm is going off and then when, when you look around and you're getting confusing messaging to say, well, yeah, I should have that granola bar and then I should have that sugar and then I should have a piece of fruit. Great, but it's all sugar, right? That becomes the staple of what people have is everything breaks down to sugar. So who wouldn't feel moody and upset, right? And if you do it long enough, you start thinking that's normal, but in reality, our diet is, especially a sugar diet, even if you're saying, well, I don't have a lot of sugar, it's impressive. What we think is not a lot of sugar is a crazy amount of sugar relative to 50, 70 years ago, where people never consumed so much sugar. So it affects every single person's mood, is it completely changes your microbiome and how your body is designed to function. One last question. Thank you. Uh, you spoke briefly about kidney stones and kidney disease. Could you talk a little bit more about how to prevent kidney stones um, by way of diet? You want to flush out your kidneys. You want to be mindful of all these, the calcium-rich dairy, um, calcium carbonate supplements. Um, the key is, is you want to take good care of your kidneys. So. And you also want to think about how much protein you're consuming, because if you overload your kidneys with too much protein, what we consider is protein like fish and dairy, beef, red meat, you actually overload your kidneys. They can't handle all of that. So you've got to lighten that load. When you lighten the load and you help the kidneys do their job, then even if you have kidney stones, they don't end up actually causing a, a big problem. Because right? there's many people that when they actually become symptomatic from kidney stones, the problem's been going on for a really long time. But eventually, it just it comes to a head. So it's not to say if you have kidney stones, like you're, you're in trouble. It's just the fact that you want to just be gentler on your kidneys in order for your kidneys to take care of the rest of your body.